Steam locomotives were some of the most powerful machines ever built. They pulled trains that fueled our imagination. They represented vision, collaboration, ingenuity, customer service, and extraordinary human achievement. But in order to get to their destination, it took someone guiding them through a series of switches in order to get to the main line. Just like leaders today, it takes someone directing them down the right path in order to get to their destination. Welcome to Mainline Executive Coaching ACT, which stands for and Cultural Transformation, hosted by Master Certified Intelligent Leadership Executive Coaches, Michael Bailey and Rich Barron. With over 50 years of successful cultural transformation and quantum leadership development between them. Brought to you by Intelligent Leadership Executive Coaching, the world's foremost authority on cultural transformation and intelligent leadership development. Once again, thanks for joining us and enjoy today's show. Leaders, are you ready to lead? This is Mainline Executive Coaching, ACT. We're here to help you and assist you in your leadership development, your executive coach development, and your culture. I'm here today with Rich Barron, my partner. I'm Michael Bailey, and we've got a very special gift we are very excited about, Dr. Mike Smith. We're going to introduce him in just a moment here. And today we're going to be looking at culture. Dr. Mike is now writing a book, and, and he's going to share that with us. And I think you're going to find it very exciting, very inspiring, and look forward to that release. It's coming up fairly soon, so we want to get into that as well. Basically, we want to look at, you know, what in the world world is culture? It is so difficult to define. It's difficult to say what is a good culture, what is a not so good culture, what is a great culture? We want to get into all of that. So thank you for being here. We are ready to take off. We hope you are ready to take off as well. So Dr. Mike Smith, would you please be so good to introduce yourself? We're honored to have you here. Thank you so much, Michael and Rich. I appreciate you both. Appreciate the time. Yeah, so just a quick background. Uh, again, Dr. Mike Smith. Um, I did 26 years in the Air Force. Uh, my last three years, I was the first sergeant for the Air Force Thunderbirds. Amazing, awesome job traveling the world doing air shows. Retired from active duty, then became a uh, senior corporate leader in a Berkshire Hathaway company, working for Warren Buffett and Greg Abel. Along the way, I got my PhD in industrial organizational psychology. Uh, walked away from corporate America to start my own speaking, training, and coaching company. Along the way, I met John Matone, who I'm now the CEO of, of his company, and he's uh, the number one executive coach in the world, has been for the last four out of five years. And that's what brings us together today. That's me in 30 seconds. Okay. Rich. Excellent. And, and, and Doc, <laughs> that's, that's a bad habit, Doc, Doc uh, uh, calling, calling you that. But uh, we've known each other for a few years now. And went through the certification process to become uh, coaches with you. Yep. And yep. one of the things we've talked about a lot um, over the past few years is culture. You know, culture. And I think there's a, there's a definite issue going on in corporations today. Do we truly understand what culture is? Is it, uh, and it doesn't matter who you talk to, you're, it seems like you're going to get a different answer from from different sources from different companies and uh but it never seems to hit the mark some do but it, it just seems like it's, it's not something that's really gelling within their organization or they don't really understand how to put it into place mm -hmm. what's your thoughts on that no i would agree 100 percent um I, I think one of the problems is that culture itself even the definition the word is kind of so clouded. I mean, it's thrown around so much. It's kind of a catch word, a catch phrase. I mean, and you're right. I think different organizations and different people ascribe different meanings to it, right? So it's kind of like one of those passing fancies, whatever's in the headlines today, that's going to be our cultural issue. And I think part of the issue is getting back to basics, right? Mm -hmm. First of all, what is culture, right? To any organization, to any leader, how do you Rich, Michael, define the culture of your company and what you do. How does any leader define culture, right? What does that really look like? Because it's more than just, and this is so cliche, but, you know, Rich, we were talking beforehand and you just saw something on LinkedIn, but 
some companies associate culture directly with the color of the carpet, how nice the break room is. Do we have a fitness center on site that people can use, right? right. Those right. kinds of things. And that's really not culture. When we talk about culture, it's really the collective body of the individuals within the organization that bring diversity, different background, different experience, come from different walk of life, have different stories. And the culture is really how do we combine all of that individual uniqueness into a collective movement that drives forward the progress of the organization, right? By being inclusive and leveraging every single person of the organization, right? I think that's really to summarize culture, what it is, is given all of that consideration. And then secondary to that is how do we improve the workplace and the workspace, but that's really not culture. No, you know, it, it's interesting. You mentioned uh, the break room as people thinking that's the area where culture is, is defined. Um, and for, for most people, if you walk in the, the front door of, of a, a business, you can pretty much tell what the culture is going to be like. Mm -hmm. What's on the walls? What, what are we talking about as far as the employees? What is, what is the, the, uh, the front office feel like? What does it look like? How are you greeted? Uh, there's a lot of telltale signs. Mm -hmm. Right as you you walk in, or even from the outside of a building, you know what what's it what's it like out front? Um, you know, do the employees have to walk a long ways to get into the the doors while there's there's a row of Teslas sitting there in in front? And we've seen this before, but that that's you know, and we may joke about that. But that really is an indicator of what what goes on inside those walls. Right. And I think if I could on that point, you know, something that, that I use a lot when I when I do workshops and, and keynotes and everything and even working with clients is, you know, generally, I think today and, and this is pretty much true across the board in society, we put too much emphasis on the container and not enough on the contents. Right. right? Just look at the cereal aisle in a grocery store. Right. right. Those high sugary. I'll admit they, they taste pretty awesome. But those cereals, you know which ones I'm talking about, right? The box looks amazing. It's colorful, Toucan Sam or whatever. You know, it catches your attention, right? Your eye, you are just navigate towards it. But then if you flip it around and look at the label of what's actually in it, right? Probably not the best for you, but I think that's kind of generally speaking, right? The society we live in, if it looks good, then it must be good, Right without peeling back though, and really diving into where even are we now and what do we look like now? And then where must we go and how do we measure and plan for that? It reminds me of the way they bag potato chips these days. You know, again, the colorful appealing labels, it's, oh, it makes you almost start salivating as you're looking at it. And then you get it and you start looking at, you know, this is just a lot of air. There's not a whole lot of content in here. So right. it looks good, but it's kind of empty when you really get down to it. And I'm paying a lot of money for a lot of air. You know, yep. I, I could just breathe it. I didn't know I have to buy it in a bag. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I'm kind of curious when you've done all this work and you've done some amazing work and associations and with different organizations, you've got a lot of experience under your belt there. And it's very, very impressive. Have you noticed if there's certain kinds of principles that seem to be applicable across the board that make for great cultures and when those principles are violated or broken or somehow corrupted, things start to fall apart. Could you maybe address like, OK, the universal things we could look for in a great culture. These are the things you'd find. So that, that's really that's really an interesting point. And, and and if I could talk to that for just a second, I think what you said kind of sums up another trap that a lot of organizations fall into. There are certain foundational things that you can put in place to build to define, to communicate, to embrace, and to live your culture. But those are truly organizational dependent, mission dependent, vision dependent, and even geographically dependent, right? Mm -hmm. So to your point, I think a trap that we could fall into is rather than taking the time to dive into our organization, who we are, what we stand for, and what mission we must accomplish, we kind of look at other organizations and say, well, you know what? Mm -hmm. That organization gets a lot of great reviews. Employees seem happy. So why don't we adopt and use their culture in our business? 
Mm -hmm. Could it work? Maybe. Is it a gamble? Yes. Are there things you can learn from other cultures to then again, do that deep dive in your organization and your business and then tailor some of those principles to meet your needs? Yes. But there isn't really a cookie cutter approach to culture. Right. Again, I think if you stick with those basics of inclusiveness, team, we, right? Taking advantage of the individuals and the uniqueness for the collective good, and then aligning that with things like your vision statement, mission, purpose, values, and the operating imperatives of the organization, that's what's going to allow you to create an amazing culture that can stand the test of time, right? That's in my book you mentioned. That's what I talk about, legacy-inspired culture versus a personality-driven culture. Okay, let's take it to give us some examples from your own experience that will be in your book that are illustrative of what it is you're speaking about here. So one of the things that, and this is what really was the catalyst for me to start writing this book is, you know, I was spent three years um, on the Thunderbirds. Air Force Thunderbirds have been around for 63 years, you know, travel all over the world. As soon as people see the red, white, and blue jet or the patch, which you see over my shoulder here, it's automatically associated with pride, precision, passion. You know, you're in for an awesome show, right? The flying, the ground show, it's all, it all goes off without a hitch, right? But every two years, the commander changes. So that's like a constant rotation of the CEO. And with that is a different personality, right? Different story, different background, came up from a different area. But yet the, the culture never changes on the team. And it wasn't until just like a year, year and a half ago that it really hit me. And I asked myself, well, why? How does an organization that's been around for 63 years travels and lives together on the road eight months out of every year is gone, like away from home, traveling, doing air shows to represent the Air Force, to recruit, to retain. What was it that makes that happen and allows it to never miss a beat, right? Every two years, new commander, but the culture stays there. Everyone knows what the vision is. Everyone believes in what they're doing. Everyone wants to be a part of the team. Everyone knows the work that's expected. Everyone knows what the show's supposed to look like. Everyone knows how they serve, right? So it's all this stuff that people come in and without a whole lot of ramp up time, they just kind of embrace the culture and step into it. So I really think probably the most fundamental thing that allows that to happen is being crystal clear on the mission right? That is kind of like the overarching umbrella, right? The mission, vision, purpose of the organization. Why do we even exist, right? What's our purpose? What are we trying to accomplish here, right? So being really crystal clear on that then allows you to create the elements of culture to support that and to move it along, such as belief, dedication, loyalty, job knowledge, execution, right? All those kind of things that are critical and key to an organization being able to evolve, to get better, to sustain and to improve. Those are the things that are a result of going back to step one that I talked about. And it hit me I really love stuff. I mean, when you really take a look at it, you're coming talking about people that have been in the military. They understand the military life. They understand the military mindset, the military discipline. So they're already coming from a high level of performance, accountability, expectation working together that i mean that's that's an amazing pull from which you pick to have these these selected individuals involved what if and and that and that's an extraordinary culture that's an extraordinary thing that you folks put on there what happens if you're not at that level of like performance integration accountability how do you start creating that so there's the sense of we're in this together we're really moving towards something great we're not there yet but we understand the necessity and the importance of what must be in place for us to achieve that. Help us with that a little bit, because most people are going to be there. Right. So, so I think exactly what you just said is the most first important key step is understanding, acknowledging and embracing that we're not there yet. Right. Right. I, I think really that's the first, like, let's, let's not gloss over it. Let's not try and make it different than it is and just paint the pretty picture and put it like, 
let's be real about where we are, right? And to me, it's exciting when as an organization, you have a, a senior leadership team that acknowledges and realizes, hey, you know what? We're pretty darn good. Like we got a pretty good game, but we can get better. Like we haven't arrived yet. We're not the best we can be. So let's do something about it, right? So that vulnerability, that ownership, and that personal responsibility about diving into, again, measuring, like I know both of you as intelligent leadership coaches, you have ways where you can actually measure and assess the current state of the culture, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And then you have a way you can create a roadmap and a blueprint to walk someone through a cultural transformation journey. And those are the kinds of things it really takes, right? It's just like a Garmin. You have a solid starting destination. As soon as you turn it on, your Garmin knows exactly where you are, right? And then you also must plug in an end destination in order for your map to appear, mm. right? Same thing with culture, right? You, you've got to know where you are right now and be real about it. And then you must determine what does our culture have to look like, non-negotiable, right? And that's based on things like your people, your passion, your purpose, your mission, all those kinds of things are taken into account. And then you just kind of create the map and move forward. But, it, but I love what you said, understanding, right? That, Hey, we haven't arrived yet. We can do some work, but we're pretty darn good right now. I'm going to have Rich take this over. Let me just make one final comment about this. We know that culture looks like culture should be an easy thing to do. But it is not. 75% of those companies that attempt to do culture transformations, changes on their own fail. It's very, very difficult. It's it, right. because so much of it is you just don't even know what you're getting into, let alone, you know, what's lying ahead kind of stuff. So, 100%. yeah, excellent, excellent stuff. Rich? You know, you mentioned something about people and, and, and understanding this is our goal and this is, this is how we need to get there. Mm -hmm. And the components with, within that, one of the trends that we're seeing is, and talking to uh, different people is they're talking about now the, with the economy kind of changing right now, the first budget cuts they're seeing are these employee development programs, the people. And we, we talked a lot of them. They're saying, well, we can't do it this year. I haven't had one comment. They said, we're in a crypto winner to 2023 is a crypto winner. We're going to revisit this in 2024. You know, and that's one of the, the disturbing trends because it's about talent. It's about people. 100%. Um, it's about, uh, you know, years ago, now you probably read this. Bill Conway's The Quality Secret, The Right Way to Manage. Came out in the 80s, 90s. One of the things he, he mentions in there is the biggest waste in any organization is people's time, energy, and talents. And when you're not developing people or you're cutting their budgets out or you're doing something that's going to hinder that roadmap, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think that's a really valid point that that, that is happening. And, and it's it kind of goes back to what you said. You know, there, the cliche saying, and I know that you both have heard it, I'm sure all the listeners have heard it, but how many times have you seen an article or heard a leader say people are our most valuable resource, right? Mm. Yeah. But without investing in people, without training them, without helping them advance, number one, are they really your most valuable resource? And if we're not investing in them through our energy, time, effort, and resources, then how valuable are they? in terms of keeping things evolving and growing, right? It's just like a car, right? If we never invest in our car and it runs out of gas, it's going to be a really nice lawn dart, right? If we don't do maintenance on it, tire pressure goes low. We've been out of oil for like two months before, and then finally the, the engine is going to blow, right? So it's the same kind of analogy, right? You need to invest in those kinds of things because that does two things, right? That not only honestly helps your employees to improve, keeps them sharp, you know, growing, getting better, but it also lets them know that you really do care. Yes. Like my boss is investing in me and giving me the opportunity to get educated on X, Y, Z, fill in the blank. Right. But that shows them that you really do care as a leader that you're taking time to invest in them and develop them, right? which again, the end result of that is contribution to the mission of the organization. This is really, something that's really marvelous. I, 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 one of the things that John talks about 
with modern day leaders is a need to be altruistic. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that seems like, well, what does that mean exactly? I mean, I can see like a, um, you know, a monk being altruistic doesn't have anything anyway. So, you know, or a Mother Teresa, she could be altruistic. Or maybe like an Elon Musk, he can be altruistic. He's got all the money in the world. But most of us are somewhere in between, right? Mm -hmm. I think, though, there's another angle on altruism, which is this. If the sea level people start looking at the need that to help the company really keep moving in difficult times and challenging times, and they realize that they got to keep putting it, the investment into the people. Maybe sometimes they got to back off and say, let me not be so concerned about my bonus, my salary. Maybe I need to be a little bit more altruistic in terms of making it better for the whole organization. Let's all cut back in terms of what our expectations are and our, in terms of our perks and monetary kinds of payments, that kind of stuff. Uh, and let's invest it back into the organization so that we make sure that we're going to be here this year, next year, and for the next 20 years. Because it's right. easy to just go for that short, quick fix, isn't it? But to stand right. back and look at it more altruistically, that's what I see. I like that because I think that's not just what a great executive does. I think that's what a great leader does. Right. And that is a really sound long-term strategy for ROI, right? To your point, investing in those people and really taking a heart, just like you would analyze your culture. The example you just use, analyzing your budget, like yeah. what really we know there's some easy things that we can cut off the top. Like every, everyone kind of gets that right. But what is the, what is the, the effect of that and the impact of doing just that quick win, right? That easy hit, yeah. right? Without really analyzing like everything that we're doing and spending the time to take an honest, critical look at how we're spending, how we're managing and what we're doing with our resources. Yeah. And you know, it, it's really, it's like any any manufacturing process, any type of process. We have an end goal. This is where we want to be. This mm -hmm. is where we're starting, where we want to be. And once we get to that point, that doesn't mean we're done. We've just reached a certain point. But it's the processes that we've developed to get to that point that really are going to carry us on to the next point. Mm -hmm. And if you eliminate one of those processes or, or uh, take that out of the, the picture altogether, you're not going to achieve that end goal that you're talking about because you're, you're, and, and even if you do get close to it, you're not going to know how to get beyond it because you've removed some of that process. And so that's, I think that's exactly what we're talking about is removing that people, uh, that talent quotient, if you will, training them, bringing up that talent um, in, in your organization, keeping them engaged, keeping them uh, involved in what's going on. But if you remove that piece of the puzzle, then you're never going to get finished at the end. You're going to get there and go, well, I think we're here, but something's missing. Right. And one of the things I love about that, Rich, is it kind of really brings us back full circle, right? Long way around the barn to get back to the door, as they say. Yeah. But everything that you just said, and Michael, what you said, if we really start with culture, which is like the core purpose of an individual, right? And then yeah. why? right? Who must I become as a person and a leader? Well, the culture is basically the core purpose of an organization. So if you get that right, and that now is the lens that you view all these other things, like allocation of resources, realignments, reorgs, cuts, investments, right? Strategy. If the core purpose, a solid crystal clear culture or your core purpose is communicated, embraced, believed in, then all that other stuff will kind of take care of itself because now you're looking at it through that lens instead of the quick hits or what is everyone else doing or how's the industry performing, which are all considerations, but not the consideration. There is an acronym that you shared with us before we got on online here today. And I'd love for you to unpack it. I, I love the acronym. It really fascinated me. And that's the acronym of PATCH. Right. Yeah. So, so my book um, right now, the title is Protect Your Patch, A Key to Creating a Legacy Inspired Culture. And again, it just really came from what I learned on the Thunderbirds. Um, but patch stands for pride in what you do, attention to detail, teamwork, clarity in communication, vision, mission, right? And then honor right? Bringing honor to what you do, your company, the legacy, the history, the customers you serve. So again, those five things, when you put those all together, that 
those are the foundational elements of your patches and organization. That's cute. I like that stuff. That's really good stuff. What, what, we're going to finish up here in just a couple of minutes. Rich, what kind of questions do you have to, to help pull this together? And, and we'll start. Maybe, maybe not so much a question, but a, a, a comment. You know, there was a time uh, a few years ago, I was able to go see the, the Thunderbirds. Now, I live, I live close to Hill Air Force Base. And so it was great to see them practicing. And, you know, they actually come fly over my home and, you know, practicing. But when you go there and you watch, and as they, they're getting ready to start their show, and it's not just about precision, it's about reverence. You know, mm -hmm. you talk about pride, but there's a certain reverence involved. And uh, people are quiet. And uh, you probably, you know, people are just quiet watching as they're doing their, 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 whatever they, it is they're doing, getting ready to start the show. But you get a sense that they absolutely love what they're doing. And it's an honor to be there. Right. And, and I think if you use that example it, with, with companies, with other companies, you know, we love what we're doing. Well, it's an honor to be here. It's a, it's a safe place to give 100% effort. That's mm -hmm. the mindset. Uh, you know, people could use that, you know, and, and your, your, uh, the, the patch is, is such a great uh, idea around any company. You know, how, how do we really develop this? How do we honor that? Right, right. And, and to your point, I mean, everyone has, every organization out there has a patch, right? Or a logo, you know, Apple, yep. Google, Amazon, right. Ford, Applebee's, Taco Bell. I mean, everyone has a patch or a logo, right? So as an organization, what are you doing to protect that? Yeah. Right. The community involvement, the PR, the legacy, the way you serve customers, the way you take care of your employees, all that stuff, right? What are you doing to protect that? So, so that's kind of why I went with that. Cause again, we all have a patch, right? Even for us in, as individuals, our last name is our patch, right? So what are we doing to represent our legacy and to carry it forward and those kinds of things? So it's, it's pretty deep, but, but I like it. It's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be good. That's brilliant. It really is brilliant. All right. Thank you. Again, the name of your book, when is it going to be coming out? What can we kind of expect in terms of, I got to get that book. We're shooting for within the next six months ish, hopefully, but it's time it goes through editing and all that. So we're getting close. Okay. So when it gets close and you're actually going to, it's like, we got a date. If you, if you're good, if you like, we'll bring you back on and we can do another announcement here. Like it's ready to go. It's the book's still warm. That would be amazing. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for appearing with us today. We, you've been very, very helpful, very insightful for our folks. Great man, great suggestions, great insight, great experience. Yes. We're honored to have him here today. So let's wrap this up. Thank you, Doc and Rich. Let's wrap it up here. All righty. Um, thank you so much for being on with us today. This is a, a special one that I don't think we mentioned. This is our 200th episode of Your Mind Executive Coaching. And it's been a fun ride. It's been almost two years that we've been doing this. And it was interesting. I was going back and looking on our 100th. John Matone was on. And so this is, this is, uh, you know, we're, we're keeping it in the family here. Nice. Congrats. <laughs> so, but, uh, thank you so much for being here and, uh, just a shout out to all our listeners. Uh, we've got listeners now in over 40 countries, uh, over 275 cities. Uh, thank you so much. Um, wherever you are, uh, we appreciate your support and keep, uh, listening and we'll keep, uh, we'll keep giving you some, some good stuff. All right, folks, all the best to you. Leaders, lead well. All right, and until next time, take care of yourselves. Thank you all. With all of the issues facing organizations today, leadership development and cultural transformation are needed more than ever. Go to our website, executiveleadersactilec.com. Book some time with us. Let's sit down and talk and get you on the path to success. This podcast was brought to you by Intelligent Leadership Executive Coaching, ILEC, the world's foremost authority on leadership development and cultural transformation. Once again, for Mainline Executive Coaching, ACT, this is Rich Barron and Michael Bailey. Thank you for joining us and take care.